after like six months you were now tempted to do the same thing again but you remember the way you felt the last time sometimes that way you felt is the only thing that keeps you from reindulging is to say that i i know so much joy and peace with god and i don't want to lose it the last time this thing happened i know how much i lost i know how hard it took me for me to journey back to the place where my heart was at peace therefore i'm not going to do this thing again because of how i felt that last time do you get the point do you get the point so that sometimes god actually amplifies that emotional response you see because memories the way memories are formed are by an event and an emotional experience that's how memories are formed if you had an event that's the reason why sometimes you do not remember if you brushed your teeth in the morning the reason is because there was no emotional experience associated with the brushing of your teeth if while you were brushing your teeth you saw blood you see that day is not the day you will be asking yourself did i brush did i brush did i brush did i brush no the reason is because there was an emotional experience that was evoked by the event that emotional experience ensured that that event was tied to your mind many times many times the way that you will have memories is the event and an emotional experience are you following me that emotional experience is necessary and sometimes god uses that kind of emotional experience to keep you in check to keep you in check so there are some there are some sins that you have committed and it's been five years but you can still tell how it felt do you know what i'm talking about you still remember how you felt that day you've not forgotten the reason why you've not forgotten is because there was an emotional experience there are other sins that you have done in your estimation this one is not really a sin so i beg but there is the one that you did and you knew that you could not pray for three days right that one did something to you it did something to you now the point i am making is that in repentance in repentance many times you are going to need to accept your wrong and a lot of times in the acceptance of that wrong there is usually sorrow or contrition that comes so look at what happened when the cock crewed crowed crew what did the cock do tell me tell me tell me I told you this year is not the year for English. <laughs> ah, but I mean, if they cock crude, why is it not crude? If you grow, past tense of grow is grow. Jennifer, is it crude? <laughs> when they cock crew three times, huh? you notice that what happened was Jesus looked at Peter. That was all that happened. It was a look. And that look ensured that the guy broke down. Are you following me? Because a lot of times, there is what follows the apprehension of sin. Because a number of people do not even know enough to know that they are in sin. This is the reason why when you are preaching the gospel, I've taught you, when you are preaching the gospel, you can go and be telling sinners that God is not angry with you. You can't tell that to sinners. Because God is angry with them. And the truth is, if a man has not apprehended the state of his sinfulness, he will not see a need for grace. So, a lot of times, we are preaching messages that we feel will help the sinner. Meanwhile, it is actually counterintuitive. What we are doing is we are sending them further away from grace. Because, if really, if God is not angry with me, what are we doing? What, 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 What are you telling me? Do you get the point? If you... Are you here? In the book of Romans. The book of Romans is a theological treatise that Paul sets out. And this is probably the largest 
the loudest um, treatise that Paul sets out concerning his understanding of the gospel. Most of the other letters that Paul wrote, they are called occasional letters. They were written because there were issues in the church, so he was trying to address those issues, right? And then he wrote letters into the church. The book of Romans is not that kind of book. The book of Romans is a book that he wrote to show what he believes. This is the gospel. And I'm going to put it to you. There was It was not colored by issues. That's why in the book of Romans, you will not see him saying um, concerning the things that you wrote to me. You see... It's very theological. It's very theological. In the book of Romans, you will see that the way that the book is written, there from chapter 1 to chapter 2 to chapter 3, you will see that Paul is actually laboring to establish the fact that everybody is under sin. He does not start out, he wants to present the gospel. But he doesn't start out by presenting the gospel. No. What he starts out by doing is to show the utter deficiency of everything that you could have done to get you saved and to show you that despite your best effort, you are a sinner. When you have accepted that, then he now says there is a way out. So you actually see that it's in Romans chapter 3, I think verse 23, that he actually begins to set forth what the gospel is. He used chapter 1, chapter 2, and a large part of chapter 3 to show people that they are sinners. He, that's why it looks like Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2 is not, he's just talking about there is no one righteous. You know, the point is to get people to accept the fact that they are sinners. If a man has not seen his sinfulness, he cannot see grace. Cannot see it. That's why God allowed some of us, not us, some people, because it's not you too. That's why God allowed some people to start smoking weed first huh? and to be addicted. Then he now sends an evangelist because it was at that point that the person had come to terms with the deficiency of his effort. He, have you preached to somebody before and they tell you that, boy, I'm a good person? Uh, that that's the point that this person feels because I don't drink alcohol I don't I've never killed so I, even exam or practice I've never done I'm just on my own meanwhile that kind of person if he has not accepted Jesus he's still not going to make it to heaven when you go and preach to the person the person is now going to be asking you uh, what are you talking about I'm a good person really they labor of the evangelist on that day is to show him that he's not a good person. If somebody should come and hear you, they'll think you are preaching condemnation. But if you do not set it in place, grace will not be responded to. In fact, it will not be seen. The only way that grace makes sense is when the person has seen that there is a need that he cannot supply. They will now say, okay, we know you can't supply it, but there is somebody that has supplied it. If you put your trust in this person, this your need will be catered for. Do you get the point? This is the way that the gospel is preached. The more we try to make the gospel politically correct, the further we will be pushing people away from God. You see, we are all good people. All of us, we have our weaknesses, but generally speaking, human beings are good people. It's a lie. That's not the testimony of scripture. The Bible says no one is good but God. So, actually, it is, we are all mad people. I wanted to say bad, but it won't really... Mm. All of us don't have sense. All of us. That's where all of us are. It is that even in our state, huh, God has done something about our condition. And God has done that thing in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the one that rescues us from this state. If someone has not agreed that they are in that state, what are you rescuing them from? So, hellfire is not the message of the gospel, but it is a message in the gospel. Huh? Hello? Repent or you go to hell. That's is. Is, is, is correct. They say, no, hell is not the message of the gospel. The message is about God's love. Hey, you, hold on. Hold on. Because, like I have said, 
you will not see anywhere in the New Testament where the apostles preached and their emphasis was the love of God. The love of God was communicated to believers. When they were doing evangelism, they were not saying, God loves you, come to him. No. They were saying, you are sinners. And there is a wrath that is coming. If you do not turn from that wrath, you will be consumed by the vengeance of God. So, come because there is a way of escape. That was the way that they preached. Does this mean that God does not love unbelievers? Of course. In fact, the whole redemption project, project was sponsored by the love of God. Right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It is when we were yet sinners that Christ died for us. This is how he commends his love towards us. So yes, love is at the back. But love is not in front when you are talking to an unbeliever. It is the man that has recognized his sinfulness that will be able to see that there is actually help for me. And so, you will need to paint that picture of sinfulness to the person. You know, many times you go, if you go for evangelism, a lot of times, you ask the person, are you a Christian? Right? I don't know if that's how you do it, but that's the model I use. Are you born again? The person will say yes. There's nobody that is not born again except people who are actually Muslims. But hey, yes, they are born again. So what I used to do is I used to investigate that their answer. Because if you are born again, then it means that I'm not doing anything here. Because it's evangelism. I didn't come to strengthen the brethren. You know there are some people that when they find someone that is born again, they now say, okay, I just want to, I, that's not my work. If you are born again, I've gone. I'm not looking, I'm looking for people that are not born again. So I need to investigate that your claim. Are you born again? Yes. I say, okay. If you die now, where will you go? That's when I say, eh, I'm God though. I really can't say. It depends. That's how you know that there's an issue here. Or if the trumpet should sound now, where will you go? Sound now. The trumpet cannot sound now. <laughs> You say, in fact, me, God will have to warn me, give me advance notice before the trumpet will sound because I need to repent of men. That's how you, uh -huh. That's how you know that that person is not saved. Huh? The person just goes to church. Do you get the point? So, you will now tell the person that, ah, ah, actually, if you are saved, you, you will not need advance notice before the trumpet will sound. Huh? You will need an advanced party. Then they will start listening. Sometimes they will not listen. You have to use one of the gifts of the spirit. Tell the person that. Ah! You see, so, <clears throat> a lot of times, eh, when I go out for evangelism, that's where you see that word of knowledge. That thing is that that thing is to work. Word of knowledge is to work. So practice it because when you go out, that's when you that's the that's the weapon. Those are the weapons of our warfare. So I remember the, the first day we went we went out for evangelism. Very funny experience. We went, it was mega parks. So we went opposite mega parks. There was this betting shop that was there. So I met the lady. She was the person operating the computer. And I tried to talk to her and she told me she was busy. I tried to talk to her again and she told me she was busy. There was nobody she was talking to. Then I just asked her about her brother. <laughs> now your brother that has been sick. All of a sudden she gave me attention. I said, uh -huh, now we can talk. Suddenly she was not busy again. But the funny thing that happened was there was someone in the betting shop that was listening to the conversation. After I left the betting shop, he now followed me. He followed me. The guy had been addicted. He was addicted to gambling and he was looking for a way out. He was in the betting shop. It wasn't him I was talking to. But then he was listening to my conversation with the girl. Eventually, he follows me to the next shop. We talk. I get him born again. He said he was going to come to church. Never saw him afterwards. But at least I did a bit. I've been now. I got his number. I tried to follow up a couple of times, but he wasn't responsive. But okay, no, 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 no. Was... School was not in session. 
that was 2020 so i don't think school was back yet or something so for some reason he was not he was going to leave just he was just going to leave just and that was how we we fell out of contact the point is a lot of times not a lot of times every time that the light of the gospel will shine on somebody the person is going to have to come to terms with their sinfulness if the person has not come to terms with their sinfulness the person cannot release faith to be saved there is nothing to be saved from and this might be the reason why your evangelistic efforts are not working it's because you are trying to give a solution to a problem that does not exist I should be born again why should I be born again why should I be born again? The reason why you should be born again is because there are all these bad, bad things that you do and you need to stop doing them. But I'm not doing any bad thing. Do you get the point? You, you need to be able to situate the problem of sin deeper than just the actions of the person. Because somebody can go and decide that all these bad things I'm doing now, I want to try to stop. And he will go for hypnotic therapy, something... They mess with his mind. He stops all of those things. But he's still not saved. Are you following me? So you will need to be able to situate the problem of sin deeper within the context of the individual so that the person can see that there is something that he needs. This is where the grace of God comes in. If you situate grace without sin as the background, you are going to be wasting time yours and the person's because the person will not see why he needs to accept grace are you following this is the context of repentance that someone is going this way and then all of a sudden the person realizes that he's going the wrong way it's not just about turning it's first of all a realization that i am going the wrong way and then the person turns to go the right way this is how repentance works so there has to be a change of mind first that necessarily leads to a change of action. If not, repentance has not happened. This is what John the Baptist would speak of in Matthew chapter 3. And he says to those people, he said that they needed to bring forth fruits that were meat for repentance. That's Matthew chapter 3 verse what? Verse 8, verse 7, Matthew 3, verse 7 and 8. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Verse 8, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. That if repentance has happened, they will tell fruits that are associated with the repentance those fruits are in keeping with the repentance those fruits are in keeping with the repentance they are going to be obvious that something has happened in my mind but the way we will know that something has happened in your mind is that physically materially we would actually see the fruit of that thing that has happened inside so when somebody comes and tells you eh, everybody's work with god is personal is in our heart is in our heart meanwhile this lady snapped her birthday pictures yesterday and when she snapped the pictures the slit was as high as the heavens then she now uploaded it on her status and crossed her leg then she now says jesus baby But we know that she's preaching a different message than that Jesus. There's something that she's selling. There's one market that she's selling. Then some of us, because we're trying to be good friends, will now go and carry that image. And will now put it on our status and say, Happy birthday, dearie. Much love. I don't know who is the bigger idiot. The person that snapped it or the person that uploaded it. You know, there are, some, there are some of my people. He, he, I've seen they uploaded a video or a picture. Huh? And it was not like it was very bad though. It was, uh, really, it's not like it was very bad. But I'll send them a message. I'll say, this is the kind of picture that you are snapping. When I say, then they will delete it. 
but I'm, t- I'm telling you, it was not very bad. Like, you know, there are some that are like borderline. It's not horrible, depending on how you look at it. My goal as your shepherd is to see the worst in that picture. So, yes, so that somebody will not think that you are selling something that you are not selling. So, it's my goal to say, hey, this picture can make you look like a Batman. <laughs> then you now remove it. It's a fine picture, but it's useless. But there are some of us that will support our friends no matter what. It's not, me that, it's not her picture. Let me just... I'm not serious. Sometimes you will not even carry sticker and cover that part. Then you still upload the picture. What, what exactly is inside that picture? Why you have picture where she was praying? You do not. What exactly is inside that one? You now carry sticker. You now cover it. Love emoji. You now cover it. You don't know that when you put the sticker, the first thing we see is the sticker. And we see that you are covering something. And because we are human beings, if we don't have sense, we can imagine the thing that you are covering. The damage is still done. Are you following? A few weeks ago, no, I will not say it. You need to see the point I'm making is this that there are certain actions that are not in keeping with someone who is a child of God because they are fruits that are meat for repentance. Huh? There are fruits that are in keeping with repentance. There are certain dresses you cannot wear. I'm not just talking of girls, I'm even talking of guys. You know, when these slim jeans and these things started becoming popular. Some people felt that the point of a trouser was to ensure that your legs cannot breathe. <laughs> I saw some people. The, the trouser will be so tight. If they do like this, it will tear. Guys, guys. What the, what's the plan? Just so, so that you... So what's the plan? Huh? Then some sisters will take picture, and when they are taking the picture, they will now turn their backside. Why are you turning? To sn- if you want to snap, why are you turning? What are you trying to show us? Why are you turning? Why? Why can't you take it from the front? Why do you have to turn? Ladies, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. There are some things that are not in keeping with. In our family, we don't behave like this. That's the point. We don't behave like this in our family. You see, if an unbeliever should do it, it's not our business because they are not our family member. Huh? But if you, that is, a, we will attack you. You say, don't judge. We will judge you. <laughs> we will judge. It's our work. We do it. We are licensed judges. I've not taught you about judgment, right? I've been saying I'll do it. I've not done it. I've not done that teaching. Because people think that Jesus was saying don't judge. That's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying don't judge yet. That's what he was saying. You you don't remember? He says that there is a log. There is a speck in your brother's eye. What Jesus says, that's Matthew chapter 7. What Jesus says is, remove the log in your eye. So that what? So that you can see well to remove the speck in your brother's eye. He did not say, remove your log and mind your business. No. (laughs) I remove my own. I will come for your eye. (laughs) We come for your eye. The point is, there are certain things that are not in keeping with repentance so that the moment repentance becomes only lip service and does not affect your actions it has not happened yet repentance has not happened it has not happened and repentance is not only something that unbelievers do even believers we need to repent right you you need to change your mind so you can change your action 
Are you following? This concept of repentance, it, so a lot of people are saying, don't judge me by the things I do. Don't judge me by the things I do. What should we judge you by? The Bible says that man looks on the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. I'm not God. I can't be dragging with the Lord. I will look at your outward appearance. I'm a man. I will look at your outward appearance. That's, that's how I will make judgments about you. Don't judge a book by its cover. I will judge. I, I'm not, I can't read the book, but I can see the cover. Are you following me? So, there are some people, hey. There is this, beware, beware, beware. When people start shouting religion too much, beware. When someone says, we have broken out of religion, we have broken, beware. Most times, what they are trying to do is they are trying to erode the foundations of the things that are mostly us. When, when you hear a preacher saying, finally we are free from religion, beware. I'm not saying, I say most times. So when you hear it, let your antennas go up. Huh? This one, I will say it, I will say it, I will say it. I'll say it. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I saw a picture. It was the picture of the wife of a man of God. And she was wearing a dress. Did you see that picture? So, somebody now came and said, this is a nice picture, but this dress is too revealing. The man of God now says, be free from religion. If you saw that picture, let me see your hand. You, saw, you know what I'm talking about. Good. So, you don't know. Beautiful. So that you know, because I'm not attacking the man of God. I'm attacking that thing that he did. Are you following and if you saw that picture, huh, you don't need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost to know that thing was not right. When people tell you, religion, beware, beware, beware. They will tell you that religion, how, how did our, this our, our guy say it? He said, he said that it is, it is fear and guilt. That keeps people bound to religion. How many people know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand. If you know what, oh, you okay? You, you, a lot of you don't know. Beautiful. Let's leave it like that. That's what he said. When they start saying we are free from religion, we have we, we are, beware, be very careful. Because what they will now tell you is, if you dress like this, we are what we are free from religion. Meanwhile. Repentance has visible proofs. If any man is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If all things have become new, we will be able to behold them. They will be beholdable. Huh? So, you see, you see people that are acting like the old creation then you just hear them speak in tongues there's a problem huh? are you following there's a problem <laughs> let me leave this matter because it's going somewhere that i don't want to take it to if we just think that i came to fight i didn't come to fight Repentance. There are fruits that are meat for repentance. The first is repentance from what? Dead works. So what we are saying is, the apostle was saying that you will need to change your mind and change your actions with respect to dead works. Right? Dead works. And I said that there are two things that are involved in this. So you have the repentance and then you have dead works. And dead works are part of a category of works. So, in the Bible, there are different kinds of works that are listed. 
right there are different kinds of works and um, you can basically classify them into three there are the works of the flesh there are dead works and then there are good works you have other works of something but basically you can classify them into three the bible also talks of works of righteousness so works of righteousness are classified as good works right they are under good works <coughs> and there's dead works so you have works of the flesh you have dead works and you have good works what the apostle talks about is repentance from what dead works repentance from dead works now what he's so let's go back to hebrews hebrews chapter 6 what he's talking about is turning so he's saying that the the principles the first principle the first foundation if you are going to encounter christ encounter the doctrine of christ the first foundation is in turning in changing your mind and in turning from what dead works turning from dead works now in in scripture like i said you have three classifications of works there is something that is called good works good works so maybe let me show you that um, Ephesians chapter 2 Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 Ephesians 2 verse 10 <coughs> It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto what? Good works, which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So there are good works that God has planned that we should walk in. So what God did is we were created in Christ Jesus. The, the point is hi. So my next my next series my next series is we're going to be doing new creation realities. That's the next that's the next teaching series. We need to we need to push those things. Then when we finish that one. So this this next one is in Christ. We're going to be looking at the man in Christ. Then when we finish that one, we'll now look at the Christ that the man is in. So that's that's the next two. Very you you will be don't worry. You eventually see why some of us have some confidence that some of you don't have. The reason is because of the things in Christ. He says we are his workmanship. This workmanship, what it means is you know the way workman is not the way Nigerian people used to say workmanship. Like you pay for my workmanship. They, that that's not what it is. Even though it's similar. <laughs> so you say, I'll go buy, I'll go buy Ion 2000, I'll go buy Engine 3000, then my workmanship 5000. When he says, my workmanship 5000, what he's saying is, I have a skill that can use these raw materials that you have brought to produce this thing that you want. You have to pay for that skill. So he, when he's giving you his bill, he will separate it. You pay for the raw materials, then you pay for my workmanship. What he's telling, and the the more skillful the person is, the higher the workmanship. That's why there is pillow of two thousand. She can sew for you suit, jacket, and trousers with two k. <laughs> then there's still of ten k. Then. Then you can now say that no is David Wedge used to wear. There's an appropriate K. <laughs> then you can even say, I don't believe in the G David Wedge. Then there's the Giancola. Yes, go to Instagram and write the Giancola. You see the suits very fine. Check the price before you're happy. <laughs> when you see the price, that your happiness will it will go. You will not be happy again. The reason is you see, it's not only the material that they will use. Huh? You are paying appropriately for the workmanship. What 
the tailor is telling you or what the artisan is telling you is that there is something that I have become by virtue of training and by virtue of learning and experience there is something that I have become I can craft something out of these raw materials what you are paying for is my skill it, it's not the time I spend to do it because I can tell you that this your clothes will be ready tomorrow but it's still 250k you say ah just now 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 you just collect you see the tailor may not or may spend one week on that clothes even sometimes they'll tell you to come back in two weeks actually it's still 14 hours they will use but they need to give you a sense of there was one time I was traveling we were going to Lagos I was driving and then my car started overheating then we went to one mechanic in Shagamu. Went to one mechanic. The mechanic now opened the engine. He was just doing things, doing things, doing things. He was just, after like three hours, he now coupled it back together. He said he has finished. How much? Ted 15k. So we felt he has walked, given the 15k. We drove for like 10 minutes. The car still started overheating. Then we now saw another guy by the side, so we parked. The guy now opened the engine and now removed the cover of the radiator and said that the radiator cover is not good. So if we put leather and tie it back, it will stop. So he put leather and tied it back. That was that was the solution. Meanwhile, somebody used three hours. When we now asked this guy, this thing, how much? He said true, that he cannot collect less than 7K. Ah! I said, this thing that you, he now told me that he wanted to help me, that in this area, eh, normally, he can collect 20k. He will turn the engine upside down, then he will just put that leather, because he knows that's what the issue is. But as he has told me, now nah, I should just pay him. And I, I saw the logic. <laughs> it's better for you to just do the thing, let me give you the money, than for you to waste my two hours. Do you get the point? It's workmanship. It is the skill. The point is, there is something that I have become that enables me to craft something. Huh? That thing is actually the workmanship. So, when you are paying for workmanship, you are paying for that thing. If you give me raw materials, I can make it into this thing. The Bible says that we are his workmanship. The new creation what is a masterpiece created by God we are his workmanship God sat down and walked and created the new creation and brought to the table the reason why he did that was unto good works do you see that Onto good works. You see, because if you are reading the New Testament, a lot of times you are going to be seeing works, 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 works. And a lot of times, when you are seeing works, it's going to be like in a bad sense. Right? It's not it's by grace, it's not by works. You get? Right? Aha. Uh -huh. So when you you may have this idea that works is a bad thing. Meanwhile, that's not the only kind of works that exists. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. Titus, not Genesis. Titus 2 and verse 14. It says, okay, so do do verse 13. Let's, let's go to verse 13. Alright, so it says, okay, let's go to verse 12. 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all, from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people 
zealous of good works. So, the action of Jesus in giving himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, was to an end. It is so that he can separate a particular kind of people to himself. These people are people who are zealous for good works. That when good works are involved, they are not on defense. Are you following? You know that in certain circles, is a mark of humility to pretend as if you don't want to heal the sick. Yeah, healing the sick. No, see, we were, were satisfied with the fruits of the spirit. You are a joker, boss. Because even the way Jesus ordained the gospel to be preached, huh? He ordained that it be preached with power. That's the way he ordained it. That's the plan. If you go and preach the gospel and there's no power, you are not doing it according to design. According to design, there had to be power involved. This was the reason why Jesus would tell him. I know that you are witnesses of these things, but tarry. Wait, tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. I know that you saw it, but don't go and tell anybody what you saw. Wait first. Wait until you have that which will make you a competent witness. And what makes a man a competent witness is power. That's the reason why the spirit is given. The spirit is given to the end that there might be power. Are you here? Zealous. We are zealous of good works. We are happy to preach the gospel. We are excited to heal the sick. We are blessed. We, we, are, we are very happy when it's impartation service. We are, we are glad. So if we are not, we, we are mature. Be mature. We, we are zealous. We are zealous of good works. You, you know that zeal is not a bad thing. You know, when these, our old people, they will be telling us that you have zeal without knowledge. Leave us first. Let's have the zeal first. Then we can add. Because if you have knowledge without zeal, you will be very frustrated. You will know things that you cannot do. <laughs> I know that my God, my God will never come late. My God will fight for me. He will always, I will always win the, you will not win the battle. You will not. Because what you know, you will need a particular kind of energy to sponsor it. That's where zeal comes in. So if you see somebody that is zealous, that is zealous, don't quench that zeal. Don't quench it. Don't quench it. Guide it. Guide it. Are you following me? This is lessons in fatherhood. There are lessons in fatherhood. There are certain things that you must know if you are going to be a proper father. And I'm not talking of age. That's not what I'm talking of. I'm talking of the office. Zeal is one of the things that is in keeping with the reality that Jesus purchased his, his people for. Zealous for good works. We are zealous. You know the same way people used to organize money. They used to just gather money and do party. I know you don't know. You are, you are not in the world. But you know people that know that a lot of times they will just say, what's happening this weekend? They say this weekend, independence. They say, Kai, may we go? That's how people will just gather money and go and buy drinks, rent the hall. Party has no flyer, no, but huh? but if Shalom comes and meets you and say, Kai, I want to do one Holy Ghost service in my school. People should bring money. You say, uh uh. Who will you invite first? She says, It's me, now it's me that will preach. You say, Haba. You like this. <laughs> Zealous of good works. Zealous. It, it needs to be the case that the way we are interested in good works. The only way to term it is the zeal of my father's house has consumed me. That's the way they'll be able to explain this thing that is doing you. That's what they did with Jesus. It was zeal that had it had eaten him up. Jesus was in a place where he could not see those things and keep quiet. You know, they say that some of us we like problem, we like fight, we always like 
talking the things that you no know, who send you who put your mouth yeah the one that put it on instagram i did not tell you to post it you posted it huh? the problem is we are family members that's the problem if rick ross should post it I don't have, you know, I don't have a problem with Recross or Bonner Boy. I don't have a problem. But you, you are one of our family members. You post it, we will come. We will come. Are you following? They say that we like trouble. We like the good thing is that it's not from us. They started saying it. They have been saying it before, and they have started blacklisting some of us now. There are certain places where our name have reached. Because they say that we are taking after our fathers too much. They say, don't inherit your father's enemies. You are who? I inherit enemies. Eh? That's the biblical model. When David was going to die, David called Solomon. He said, come. He said, I know you are a wise man. <laughs> I know you're a wise man and God has given you wisdom. Therefore, you see this person, 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 ensure that they don't die in peace. Solomon said, yes, sir. So Solomon called one of them and said, see you, eh? I will not kill you. But don't leave Jerusalem. The day your leg crosses the boundaries, that's the day you will die. And for, I think it was two years or three years, the man was there. Oh. Nothing happened. Then one day, village people... <laughs> One of his animals. Now he said, "Hey, my animal." Then he ran. Solomon said, "I heard that you cross." Oh yeah, that thing took three years, but he inherited his father's enemy. Huh? His half brother. That <clears throat> his half brother now came to his mother and said, "You know Abigail. Huh? That one." David did not lie with her. You know the story, right? They, David was old, so they brought a Shunammite girl. So that, but the Bible says that the king did not know her. So, that girl, now can you, let me just marry her, since the king did not know her. I said, not get kingdom, let me get something. So, Solomon's mom comes to Solomon and says, see what your brother said though. David Solomon said, "Eh, hey. you know that he was on the blacklist. He didn't know. <laughs> he didn't know he was on the blacklist." Solomon said, hey. "If he collects Abigail today, tomorrow he will say he will collect the kingdom. Bring him, slaughter him." The enemies of David were passed on to Solomon. It was Pastor Podge that showed us the other day. That that scripture hit me. I was like, Jesus. If you love him that got, you will love him that is begotten. If you do not love him that begot, you cannot love him who is begotten. You can't tell me that I don't like your father in the Lord, but I like you. It's a lie. No. It's either you take us or you leave us. And you see, this weird notion of tolerance and wokeness that we are accepting as Christians. This the reason is because we want to be a product of many graces. I, me, I'm, 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 a, I'm for the unity of the body of Christ, like Atiku unifier. I'm from the unity of the body. I belong to no man, but I belong to all men. Senu Buhari. That thing is not of God. Is not of God. Is not of God. I'm not talking of I'm not talking of like legit you, you see because I I'm not a member of deeper life but I love and honor Pastor Kumuni that's not what I'm talking about I'm not saying that maybe if you change church then we'll start fighting that's not what I'm talking about I'm saying that these people we know that these people are not correct believers we know we know we know but you can't inherit your father's enemy Is D that has eaten us up. Are you following? Hello. Is part of hell. 
I'm trying to say you need to check if you find out that there's no zeal anymore. You are very lukewarm. You have started deviating from the pattern. Champions League excites you more than evangelism. There's a problem. There's a. Are you hearing me? There's a problem. I'm telling you, there's a problem. Go and go to ICU. Go and pay somewhere and do retreat. Just notice that you like film more than you like prayer. You, even you, you know that that's not how you were when you got born again. You know now. You know that that time when you get when you got born again, when you just got filled with the Holy Ghost, that time. They say, come and you, when you visit your friend, you enter, you shake hands in tongues, shandalaba. You shake, then you put there and say, glory. You say, so what do you learn from the Bible today? He now say, oh boy, see it. That was what you used to do. True or false? That's what you used to do. But now, to purify unto himself a special kind of people. That word peculiar, it, it means that you are going to be unique. You'll be a different breed. And what will characterize these people is they are zealous for good works. Let it be that what we are telling you is be careful. Be careful. That, that's what we should be telling you. Let it not be that we are trying to get you to Let's say, ah, minister, this is your fasting. It's too much. Now, you don't think you should. That's what we should be saying. Huh? We should not be saying, don't you think you should fast? Are you following me? The sad part is there are some people that don't even know this experience at all. Because the context in which they got saved was a context where lukewarmness was the order of the day. The other day, I saw a pastor write on Twitter, and he said that that once in a while, he encourages long prayer meetings, stretch prayer meetings, like five hours, once in a while. Demons will be happy in that church. It, oh God, they will be glad. You will be doing doctrine exegesis. They will be sitting down there. Your people will be possessed, and the annoying part is they will not be able to tell you. Because your doctrine does not allow for people to be possessed. Meanwhile, you don't have the power to enforce that thing. Once in a while. Once in a while. Like once in a year. Let's just pray for five hours. Once. In... When, when we grew up, what we knew was vigil. That's the one we knew. It's in the night that we used to pray stretch prayers true of us. You know what I'm talking about now. It was vigil. That's what we knew. That's what we knew when we were growing up. And I understand that sometimes context, maybe you can't have vigil, security issues. You can meet in the daytime and pray. But we have found a way to excuse that lethargy and say it's not really about long prayer. Not really. Not really. It's more about consistency than about intensity. It's a lie. It's about two of them. If you don't have consistency, you don't have intensity, Satan will, he will play volleyball with your life. You will be the ball that his demons will be passing. <laughs> it's about consistency and intensity. See the way that the patriarchs prayed. They will pray one single prayer. When they pray that prayer, heaven will be opened. What do you think happened? It was because of an intensity that was brought to the table that had ensured that they had the ears of heaven. So in the day, there is a day that you say, God, I beg, and the heavens will be opened. It was not in that day that you generated that capital. Are you following me? That was not the day. Because there are some people that will say, God, I beg. God, they say, I beg what? Can what? A people zealous for good works. If there is anything we should be known by, we should be known by zeal. Zeal. These people, you see, those church people, ah, nah, just pray there. Pray. Leave them, just leave them, just leave them. That was what happened with the apostles in the early church. The Bible says that the people, nobody dared to join themselves to them. That the people just saw them in their own class. Say, those people, not them. 
Now them sabi this thing where they do. Just leave them. Everybody was doing their own, but they recognized that these people were in a class all by themselves. But because we want to be accessible to everybody. You know, there are many churches where they don't even do opening prayer. Or you don't know. You just when you come, you just do worship. Then you get into the word. <laughs> and they do drama and testimony. But it's not as if they have special days of prayer. Even if you come for a prayer service, the preaching is going to be like 90 minutes, then the prayer will be like 10 minutes. That's the prayer service. Uh, drama. The reason is because they are trying to adapt to the community. So that people, you know how they used to say it, let people not be put off when they come. Let us be able to accommodate. You know, we are coming from different backgrounds. It's true, we are coming from different backgrounds. That's why we pray in tongues long, so that you can learn. So you can learn. So your background you can. They told us that if eating meat, we cause my brother to fall, we will not eat meat. So, even if people don't, if people they, they can't pray in tongues, we we'll just reduce it so that our brother will not fall. Meat and prayer, they are not the same. If prayer will cause my brother to fall, he's not really my brother. Oh. Prayer, how can prayer cause you to fall now? I understand meat. You don't eat goat meat. You, I understand, but prayer, bros. Every church that the epistles were written to, they were written to a church where they were saved and baptized with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. That's the context of the recipient of the epistles. It's a loss of good works. Good works. I've not. So, that's good works. So, you know what good works is about, right? All of the right things that we should do as Christians holy living, righteous living, um, expressions of the power of God, the fruit of the Spirit, all of that, the character of the kingdom, good works, right? These good works are done because we are saved. They are not done so that we can be saved. We do not, we are not doing these things so that we can eventually be saved. No, we are doing these things because we have been saved. We have been saved unto good works. You get it? Do you get it? Turn to Philippians chapter 2. Because I think that I need to make this point. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12. It is, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Next. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, he says that part of the things that you need to do is you need to work out your salvation. You need to work out out your salvation with fear and trembling so as a believer there are certain works that you have to do what he's saying is you need to work out your salvation this salvation is something that you have already you need to work it out bring it to the fore what he does not say is you need to work for your salvation he doesn't say that you are not working for your salvation. You are working out a salvation that you already have. And the reason why you are working it out is because it is God who works in you. So that for every believer, there are two workings that should be going on. God is working in you. You are working out. God is working in. You are working out. God is working in. You are working out. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling because it is God who works in you both 
to will and to do according to his good pleasure. It means that even your will to decide to do good is as a result of something that God is doing inside you. Are you following? That normally, even you, you will not even want to do the right thing. But the reason why you actually have the inclination, the the leaning to do the right thing, is because God is working in you. And you are now going to supply something to ensure that the cycle is complete so that you can work out, so that he is working in you and you are working out. This is the context. This is good works. These works are the kinds of works that believers must be doing. And a believer who is devoid of good works, that his salvation is questionable. We can question it if we don't see good works. Because for every person that is a believer, good works should follow. Behold, all things have become new. That's good works. The next kind of works that we see are the works of the flesh. So the works of the flesh, you remember in Galatians chapter 5, so where he puts the fruit of the spirit over against the works of the flesh. So the works of the flesh are manifest. And then he tells us the works of the flesh. So the works of the flesh are the kinds of actions that you do in your flesh. Right? And um, I think that you know what the flesh is about, right? The flesh is sin and self. I've, I think I've shown you that before. right? So, everything that is natural, that is not inspired by God, is fleshly. Is of the flesh. You are a very nice person, but it was not inspired by the Holy Ghost, is of the flesh. Are you following me? You know why? The reason is because that your niceness will have a breaking point. It will have a breaking point. And when it breaks, you can burn a house. You are a nice person. You don't normally get angry. <laughs> but when you get angry, you can... The one that is sponsored by the Spirit of God, that one will not have a breaking point. It, under the harshest of situations, that one will bear up. That's the reason why the Bible says... Where the fruit of the spirit, where it exists, against this there is no law. Don't worry, we'll, we'll come there, we'll come there, we'll come there. Huh? There, there needs to be everything that is not sponsored by the Holy Ghost. Is flesh. Um, is that Flora? Should we give you? Uh, so come with your implements. Come and sit in the midst of God's people. Should they clap for you as you are coming to the front? <laughs> keep clapping, keep clam, clapping till she comes. She that's how they used to say it. Okay, so just come without clap. Of the flesh, right? So, um, so maybe let's re- let's read it. Galatians five and verse eighteen. Galatians five eighteen. But if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Next. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these: adultery, fornication uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God, the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh. So you know the works of the flesh are, right? So in case you are finding it difficult to understand this thing from King James, go and read it in your NIV. 
the works of the flesh the, the apostle says they are obvious the works of the flesh are manifest so we have good works we have works of the flesh right the third category of works is what is usually referred to as works without qualification a lot of times in the new testament is dead works that's what we are repenting from in hebrews chapter 6 verse 1 that's the first pillar right of the principle the doctrine of christ is repentance from dead works what are dead works dead works are the kinds of works that are done to merit salvation to merit salvation to deserve salvation these are the kinds of things that you do and you want to be saved because of what you have done dead works even go further to make you merit anything from God so I I fasted for 40 days oh God because of that my fasting now give me an anointing to raise the dead dead works right if if you have had an opportunity to preach to people before maybe you know this you'll be able to relate to this example you know that there are some times when you have studied <laughs> you will show them oh glory you have you have written you are ready for this teaching in fact maybe you even prayed then as you are going, you say to be my because i've never prayed like this to go and preach before higher and when i don't pray see what used to happen but today that i prayed they will see something he will shock you the reason is because god is going to work hard to clear your doubt that day you will go they gave you two hours that your long note you finish preaching it in 10 minutes <laughs> Has it happened to you before? Has, that, has happened to me before. Jesus. My own was not that kind of thing, but it was something similar. When I got there, the Holy Ghost said, this is the verse that you used to preach. I say it's a lie. When I was praying, this is the one I got. Meanwhile, on the flyer, the letter that they sent to me, this is what they say. Holy Ghost said, this is the verse. I say, oh God, this is the verse that they are using. And you know the Holy Ghost, he used to argue too much. So you just keep quiet. So that's how I went. I opened the verse. I started preaching. In 10 minutes, I kid you not, in 10 minutes, my message has finished. Me that can preach, for, I can just be going. It finished. I mean, it finished. After like 10 minutes, I realized <laughs> the damage had been done. So after like 10 minutes, I said, let's take a song. Let's take a song. You know, they will think that you are spiritual, you, 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 are, they are sensing the presence of God. As I took the song, they started singing, I started begging God, I said, beg, don't be angry. That thing that you told me, I don't know that this had to be, can I now use this one? He said, go ahead. So I now stopped the song. That's how I now preached. The day that you think that you have done a lot to deserve something that God gives by grace, it will shock you. That is dead works. It is working to merit that which can only be freely given. It's dead works. And a lot of times it's tied to the demands of the law. Because under the law of Moses, the principle was if you keep the law, then you will be saved. Right? So you had a lot to do, and as soon as you are done doing it, they will now say, okay, you can be saved because of that which you have done. So that a lot of times they felt that you needed to do something. You needed to do something to deserve. That's the point. The point is to deserve to deserve to have the sense of merit when you are dealing with a god that only gives by grace is dead works are you following me dead works Hebrews 
chapter 9 Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14 Hebrews 9 verse 14 She can ju just give her a drink give her a drink <laughs> You didn't eat this morning, yeah? <laughs> Did you? <laughs> there are some things you should not do on an empty stomach. It is how much more? So let's do let's do verse thirteen. Let's see verse thirteen. Aha. Uh -huh. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies to the purifying of the flesh how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to god purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living god again you can see the context the, the context is clearly salvation right in the in the previous verse he's talking about the blood of bulls and goats trying to sprinkle you so that you can be saved how much more shall the blood of christ purge your conscience from dead works the point is the first pillar of the doctrine of christ is repentance turning changing your mind and turning from every work that you can do to deserve salvation That is the principle. But you see, you need to now carry it as a core part of your life and your relationship with God. Don't try to deserve anything. Huh? Hello? Uh, be a perpetual, if you like, beggar. That's a broken heart and a contrite spirit. God cannot ignore that one. Be a perpetual beggar. Let it be that everything you received from God was received by His mercy. Are you following me? Let, don't have anything that you say, eh, hey, because I've done this, now you must... Eh, eh. Even when God has done it, you need to be thankful. You see, so sometimes God will ask you to pray about something or you pray about something. So when you pray about the thing, God now answers, you now receive the answer to the prayer then you now think that you don't need to give thanks. Because I mean, you prayed, he answered. I did my part, you did your part. You could have done your part and he will not do his own. And you cannot beat him. Don't deserve oh. Don't put yourself. You can actually put yourself in that place. That's where Jacob put himself in. Don't put yourself there. So, he says, repentance from dead works. So, you need to change your mind and you need to turn from trying to merit your place in Christ. You need to realize that meriting it will not get it to you. And then it takes you to the next point. The next point is what? Faith in God. Hebrews 6, verse 1. not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works which we've tried to look at and of faith toward god so it tells you that repentance from dead works when you have turned from meriting from deserving from trying to earn when you have turned from that point there is a posture to be taken that posture is faith toward god so that I'm not trying to earn. I'm not trying to earn. I'm actually just trying to receive. Are you following me? Now, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And verse 4. But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins 
has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, he says, it is by grace that you are saved through faith, and it is that not of yourself, it is what? The gift of God. In verse 9, Nephthys. it says, not of works lest any man should boast. So you are seeing that your salvation is by grace through faith and it is not of works. What what kind of works do you think is going on here? Dead works. The reason why nobody can boast is because all of your works to end salvation is dead. You, It cannot get you anything. Huh? You cannot walk your way to salvation. So you see those people that used to tell you that when the rapture happens and the first boss will go, the second boss, you will end your salvation. Have you heard? Have you heard that thing? That they will torture you. You have to, because I think they say that the Holy Spirit will have me withdrawn or something. So you have to, you have to suffer. Then when you have suffered well, God will say, God save you. <laughs> Please allow them to now enter into the kingdom of God. How you, one of the ways you can know that is not true is because he contradicts the principle of the doctrine of Christ. That principle is you cannot walk way into salvation. So you may not know what is the truth concerning that doctrine, but you know what is the lie. This one that you say we will suffer first, then when we suffer, they will now say, okay, you have end or you are coming. We know that is a lie. Dead works. That's the first step. Huh? repentance from dead works. It is not of works lest any man should boast. The moment it becomes of works you will be able to boast. Yeah, somebody will be able to boast. Meanwhile, the goal of God is nobody will be able to boast. Everybody that enters into heaven, everybody from Abraham to the last person, everybody will know that they didn't deserve to be here. Even me and you included. You see, nobody is going to go to heaven and be saying, eh uh-huh. You, you will not be able to raise a shoulder. No. There is no one that will deserve it. However, there will be all of us that know that the reason why we are here is because of the worth of another. It, all of us will know that we are not supposed to be here. However, we are here. Huh? Hello? We will not be surprised that we are there. Oh. Generally speaking we will not be surprised that we are there. But we will know that we did not deserve it. It's not of works. So that you see that faith is usually set over against works. Right? So that with respect to salvation, the opposite of faith is works. You can either put your faith in God or you can be trying to Get it. Give me Romans chapter 4, verse 1. Romans chapter 4 and verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, has found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. Now stop here. Stop in verse 2. Give me the HCSB, just so that it gets easier. For those of you that are not familiar, I like the HCSB. It gives a different reading style from the King James, and it's a very good translation of the Bible. It says, if Abraham was justified by works, then he has something to brag about. But what? But not before God. This is what the apostle is saying. That if it were works that they were using to ensure that people are saved, Abraham, 
Abraham will have something to brag about. But not before God. Because both Abraham and God know. Huh? You see, other people may not know. But Abraham and God, they know what happened behind the scenes. You see, God knew. Okay. If you read to the end of this chapter, you will see what God knew. You know, in this chapter, the Bible says that Abraham was not weak in faith. Abraham was strong in faith. He was giving glory to God as he was anticipating the promise. Huh? God knew what happened. The guy thought that it would not work. So when his wife said, see Hagar, he said, if you insist. Meanwhile, he has been looking that side before. You may have something to boast. When you meet God, that your boasting will end. Because you may deceive all of us. Right? When you meet God face to face, you and God will know what happened. If Abraham were justified by works, he can brag, but not before God. Verse 3. What does the scripture say, therefore? It says that Abraham believed God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him for righteousness. Again, you see that belief, faith, is set up over against works. I'm saying that you can try to deserve something or you can believe that you receive it. And because we are talking of the principles of the doctrine of Christ and the initial concept context is salvation, you can tie this to salvation. Say that nobody, nobody can be saved by their effort. The only way to be saved is to put your faith in Jesus because it is by grace you are saved through faith. Grace is what actually supplies. Faith is what receives. So if grace alone was working, you will not be saved. And if faith alone was working, you will not be saved. You will need a combination of grace and faith to be able to be saved. And when the Bible is talking of faith towards God, it's talking about your response to what God has initiated. So, God has procured salvation and God has delivered salvation to you. What you are meant to do is to stretch out your hands and receive. That is faith. It is faith that takes. It is faith that accepts. It is faith that receives. Are you following me? Do you, did you see the video? There was the video of that guy that says that I've been preaching to you since you have not accepted Christ. How can somebody die for you and not accept him? If you don't accept him by tomorrow, I will beat you. <laughs> did, you did you see that video? It was hilarious. But it made a lot of sense. How can somebody die for you and you not accept him? You see, the only thing you have to do is to just accept. That's all. And you refuse and we beat you. Like. <laughs> it is faith that accepts. It is faith that receives. And as it was in salvation, so it is in your work with God. There is nothing in God that you will get because you did it. God can come and tell you, um, this you want this anointing, fast for 14 days. You see, number one, that your 14 days fast is not enough to buy anything from the Spirit. Hmm? Many times, what that your fast will do is to shape you into the kind of vessel that can host that thing. Because it's possible that you are a basket. God wants to convert you from a basket to a bucket. Huh? Because if he puts that thing inside the basket, it will leak. So God will tell you, fast for 14 days. That 14 days fast is actually what will do the conversion to turn you from the basket to the bucket so that when he puts it, it will stay. You will be deceived if you thought that it was your fasting that bought it. Hello? So that when a lot of people are talking about the miraculous and the anointing, a lot of times they talk about paying the price. There's a price you pay, but it's not what you're thinking. It's not what you're thinking. People think that that price is you spend time fasting, you spend time praying. That's not the price. 
That's not the price. When the anointing comes upon you, that's when you will see the price. You will pay the price post receiving the anointing. You, you didn't get it. The price to be paid for the anointing is not paid before the anointing comes. Generally speaking, it is paid after it has come. When the anointing comes, the anointing will now start making you into a different kind of person. That's when you will know that you are paying something. Hello? So you see all those things that you were doing before the anointing came? That's not the price. That's not the price. But you will pay. You will pay. <laughs> the point is, as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in, in your work with God. You cannot deserve anything from God. You cannot say, oh God, you see now, I've been, I've been a very good somebody now. Oh God, now give me a husband. Uh -huh. It doesn't work like that. If God will give you a husband, it will be because he gave you by grace. And if he gives by grace, the way to receive is how? By faith. That's how it works. We don't deserve anything. This is the reason why we, we do not boast. This is why if you see a preacher that is boastful, that preacher does not know God. At the very least. And at best, eh? at most, at the top, if we actually follow it to the logical conclusion, that thing, it may not be God that gave him. You cannot be you cannot be intimate with God and be proud. You can't. You, you are not going to decide to be humble. No. But if you are intimate with God, you are going to be in the presence of perpetual infinity. You will see how tiny you are. You know, because pride is, pride is a sin of comparison. Pride is a sin of comparison. If you are the only person that is doing it, you cannot be proud. The reason why you are proud is because you are doing it better than someone else or you have it better than someone else or you can do it better than someone else before pride can come in you will need to compare you will need to compare if it is true that you are in the presence of god the reference for your comparison is going to be eternity you will see how small you are it will it will it will make you humble it will make you humble a proud man does not know god doesn't you know there are some people that are very narcissistic huh the world revolves around them it, the world has to revolve around them they don't know god if you know god that thing it will just die you will eventually realize that you are not that important too If you know God, you will know that when God uses you, it's a privilege for God to use you. Because God can decide to not use you. And his goal will still be accomplished. You are not that important. Are you following me? You, you, you will know, you will actually know that when God uses you, it's, it's a privilege. It's an honor to be able to speak for Jesus. It's an honor. So the, the moment someone starts becoming proud because of the things that God is doing through him, he tells you that something is off. This person is not in the presence of God. Or at least he's not estimating himself correctly. Because if he was, narcissism cannot be Are you following? Repentance from dead works. And what? Faith toward God. This is how we get into the kingdom. This is how we get into faith. This is how we get into Christ. It's repentance from dead works and faith towards God. And like I said, as it was in the beginning, that is how it will be in your work with God. Now, if there are any questions from this initial session, I will take them and then we will go on a break. If there are other random questions, we'll take them later on. But from this initial, any questions? Um, let's see if we can have them. Are there any questions? 
if there are questions online, let's also know. If you have a question, just raise your hand. So wait for a few minutes in case there are questions um, from those following us online. Because there are no questions in the house. Where are the questions? If there are questions, do you have a question? You are shy. Okay, please give her the mic. I thought you said you have a question. Okay, you want to write it? Me too, I'm shy. <laughs> Should I write? <laughs> you want to write? Okay, yeah, so you can write if you want to write. If you want to write, write. There's no stupid question, there's no silly question. All right, she's not shy again. Glory. It's your hair. You can't even be shy. All right. Um, I don't know if I'm supposed to give vote of thanks first. For what? <laughs> okay, but really, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. God bless you. We're so grateful. Really grateful. Okay, so my Wait, question. So this a vote of thanks is enough for every other person, <laughs> right? So next time, just. <laughs> All um, right, so my question is um, with respect to faith towards God uh -huh. and dead works, it's more of a practical question. And I'll be so happy if everybody can relate. I need everyone to relate. Okay. So, um, it's the explanation is understood. The explanation is beautiful that. We cannot deserve anything from God. We cannot merit things from God. We receive things from God as God gives us by his grace. Now, my question is, how do you deal with your heart when in your heart of hearts, you know that this thing, you do not merit it? But in a, in a fraction, in <laughs> that place, there's that middle line where you honestly... You honestly know that I don't deserve this thing, but you know that today something happened and you're happy. You are really happy and you're now confused as to whether you actually know that you deserve this thing or you don't deserve this thing. You're honestly confused and you're begging God. You're like, God, this is how I feel. I know the truth, but this is how I feel. Probably because I probably prayed. Or even sometimes I didn't pray before I took up that function. But it went exceptionally, exceptionally well. So how do you deal with the tussle in your heart? How do you deal with those kind of situations when it keeps bugging? And keeps yeah. yeah. So do, do, do you get it? You can relate, right? She says you have to relate. <laughs> so the posture of my heart is that I can never deserve anything. That one, I've settled it. I've accepted it. I've settled it. I have I have accepted that I will never deserve anything. So everything that happens well is because of God. The one that happens bad is because of me. That's my posture. If, if I went to minister somewhere, right, or I prayed for you know, so the other day, I, I, Sam was asking me because myself and Sam will travel quite a lot. So I think one after one of those sessions, he was like, he has a question. I was like, okay, what's the question? It was something like what he said, right? Um, how is it that all of these beautiful, mighty things are happening, but you stay humble? And the answer is because I know that I don't deserve it. I know whether I prayed or not, I still don't deserve it. You can never pray enough to get someone healed. So if someone got healed, it was because God wanted to do it. It's not because you prayed. However, you will need to pray so that God can show mercy and heal. But when he decided to show mercy and heal, it was not because you prayed. It was because he wanted to do it. Huh? But if it does not happen, it's my fault. I didn't pray enough. But I can never pray enough. That's, that's the posture of my heart. So, if you agree that you will never deserve anything from God, never, anything you get will be a gift. 
whether you prayed or not if you have accepted that then even when those mighty beautiful wonderful things are happening you will never be tempted to think that it was because of you this is exactly how to ensure that you never stand in the way of god's glory you know why the reason is because god is going to give you glory hmm? god gives people glory i think i've thought i've thought god puts glory upon people he does but if there is glory it needs to be the one that god puts you need to ensure that you don't take his own and the way to ensure that you don't take his own is to ensure that your heart is in a perpetual state of dependence upon his mercy if anything good happened it was god that did it even if i fasted for 10 years before i went to that place then something mighty now happened it was that fasting for 10 years is not enough to buy something from the spirit realm it's not enough it's not strong enough right there are stronger forces than your sacrifice huh yes there are stronger forces than your sacrifice the will of god is a stronger reality in the spirit realm than your sacrifice if the will of god does not will a thing there is no amount of sacrifice that you can put on the table that will ensure that that thing comes to pass it means if that thing came to pass ultimately it came to pass because the strongest force was at work which is his counsel do you get the point that's when beautiful things happen i'm happy i'm happy because i don't deserve it that's why i'm happy sometimes i go home i'm like hey god the reason why i'm that happy is because i know that if god wanted to use me to determine what he will do nothing would have happened because i don't deserve it that's actually why i'm happy there is a temptation for you to feel like you are a superstar you start feeling like I know this things. I know this things. You know, sometimes, maybe someone is preaching. You're just looking at the person. Like if, if I if I touch this verse, <laughs> this thing I'm telling you, it has happened with me. I'm not telling you things that have not happened. I'm telling you that day. I I remember that day. I went to my father in the Lord. I went and met him. I see, sir, there's problem. See what I'm thinking. Then he helped my life because i'm telling you you will find out that the deeper you get into god the tendency huh, to think that you are something is going to keep increasing you will be for paul paul saw revelations they had to give him a turn in his flesh so that he will not forget <laughs> that he's a human being they, god had to put something there when he went to pray god said you see this one it's a lie you will see it will remind you that you are su- surviving on something that is not your own. It is my grace that will be sufficient for you. You will know weakness. In this issue, you will know weakness. God left it there with a man so that he can constantly remember that it is grace that powers everything that he sees. So you will hear Paul will say that, I labored more than they all, yet not I. It was the grace of God that was with me. What is he saying? I labored. There was something that I did. But actually, I know what is going on behind the scene. That it was grace. It was supply from that end. There is a way that supply will be taken away. And I will labor. And it will be obvious. There is nothing. Part of the things, especially as you go further in your work with God, and as God begins to use you, part of the things that you will need to do regularly is this motive check. Huh? This will be your strongest protection. Are you hearing me? This will be, you see, because God will use you. God will do the mind-boggling, ear-tingling things with your life. You will need to realize that actually, I don't deserve it. I know that you studied so much and you prayed so hard and you fasted so well and all of a sudden things began to happen. The moment you think that you deserve it by the things that you have done or the moment you think that what has happened is because of what you did you see you may not say you deserve it you may not say it like that but you say it's because i did this thing that this thing happened so do not tell you that if you want to see the kind of results you have never seen before you need to have you heard those kinds of things hmm. you need to ensure that you keep reminding yourself 
that you don't deserve it. It, it comes. We have those. It comes. You need to keep reminding yourself that this thing is grace. This thing is grace. If you keep reminding yourself, no matter how loud people are singing your praises, do not enter your ear. I'm telling you to not enter. To not enter. Do, do you get it? Does that help? All right. Any other question? There's okay. There's a question online. Three questions. Four. Okay. So let's take the in-house ones first. So please get to the mic to to minister. Has anybody written questions? If you've written a question, just pass it to. Okay, minister has her own mic. The question is, um, when you, on when you spoke about repentance from dead works, yeah. so I wanted to ask, um, what approach of evangelism do you use for um, people who are Christians or they go to church, but then they um, consciously indulge in like acts, like sinful acts, yeah. and then um, I don't know. Do you start by telling them that, okay, I'm sure they definitely know that, okay, this thing is wrong, this thing is wrong, but they still engage in it. So do you start by preaching the gospel all over to them? Or, like, what approach do you use? All right. So if someone is a Christian and the person is not living like a Christian, your reaching out to that person is not evangelism. Evangelism is reaching out to someone who is not a Christian. Right? So this person, you know this person is a Christian. Like you're sure. And the person is sure. I'm born again. We know. I know you're born again. You know you're born again. Right? But this person is living a life that does not look like. Right? So what the person needs is discipleship. It's not evangelism anymore. What the person needs is discipleship to call the person back to order. You see, because there are certain things that will persist in the life of someone who is genuinely saved if the person is not taught if the person is not taught so if this person is living a life that does not glorify god this person is constantly living in sin if the person is happy to keep living in sin then the person is not saved so if someone says this thing i am doing i know is wrong but we keep doing it in fact i like it Meanwhile, I'm going to heaven. The person is not saved. What that person needs is the gospel, is evangelism. But if the person says, this thing that I'm doing, I don't like doing it, but somehow I can't help myself, what you now need to now bring the person to discipleship. Right? So that helps. All right. Any? Okay, so let's do the online question. There's a question here. All right, so there's a question here. Right, yeah. That's, okay, um, I have a question similar to what she was actually asking. I just need more clarity on it. Um, in terms whereby I have a friend who happens to say, okay, he has done some certain work for God. He knows that this was what God told him and he has been doing it for a while. And there's this regular said and said, um, faith without work. It's useless. And he knows that, yes, okay, he has been doing the work and he has been having faith on God for a certain, for something in in particular. Yeah. And he keep trusting in God for God to do that same thing. I think, I don't know, is it okay for the person to still put in his hope that God must do this thing? Is it okay? When you say must, that's, Maybe maybe it's just me that is picking out that word. But if, if is that word necessary for the question? Because if you say God must do something, the answer is no. God must not do anything. God is king. Right? So for instance now, say I'm a preacher, I've been preaching the gospel, but my daughter is blind. So I travel, I do healing crusade, people are getting healed, people are seeing, but my daughter at home is blind. God must not open her eyes. Right? So, because I know that God must not, that's why, like I said earlier, you have to be a perpetual beggar. That's why you keep begging. 
right it is an appeal to the mercy of god right to ensure that the thing that you want him to do gets done you can't force god you can't and then you cannot even say but i'm serving you do my own you still cannot do that one because the only reason why you are serving him is because he saved you if he didn't save you you will not be serving him you would have been going to hell so it means that every christian exists with a debt is a debt towards god right that he saved you when you were not deserving of salvation and because of that there is nothing you can do to repay that debt every other thing that god does for you is an extra do you get the point is an extra so even when you say oh god but i'm serving you eh, stop serving now if you stop serving and you fall out of christ it's still you that will suffer god will not lose anything because that thing that you are doing somebody else will do it the point is you do not have any basis to demand that god must do anything right that's why you keep asking you keep praying you believe by faith you receive but you do not say that he must in that sense you get the point because he must not he must not if god decided not to save anybody nobody nothing would have happened do you get nothing would have happened even salvation that god did if god said i would not do salvation there's nothing that anybody will do so even salvation is a gift right the anointing is a gift the ability for you to do the work of god is because of the gift that he has given to you so you cannot now use that gift to demand if you you stay in a house somebody now comes to your house to squat with you you know all those people that used to say i'll stay for one week then it turns to one one year so this person is in your house you are giving the person food you you know the person has you know those kind of people they have never bought anything in the house they are just there they are just in the house like that then the person after eating he washes plate you bought the food you went to the market you bought the food you walked first got money used the money went to the market bought food when you brought the food home you cooked the food then they, you dished the food for him then he ate the food then when he finished eating the food he now washed the plate he now tells you that because he has washed this plate now you must pay his school fees see that's what a lot of people do with god because god has done everything and brought you to the place where you can work for him you say okay because i'm working for you you must no again you appeal to his grace that's what we do do you get it all right so last question here then we go online all right so this question minister you can you turn turn the mic on so that okay my question is what she asked and yeah. answer and okay you said if it's um someone who is a believer yeah. then it is no longer evangelism yeah okay now um oh i've seen that okay having christian background and maybe parents as pastors and oh it's not enough or it's not a certain that the children are saved. Yeah. Even though they always go to church and they are involved in the church setting. Yeah. Okay, when you have okay, let me give this instance. There's somebody you know that okay, f- well have this background, but from a conversation you know that okay, this is not sound and maybe okay, I don't know if it's to classify that person as born again to start with, or but I know that the person have a knowledge of at least from the going to church, definitely there's some deposit inside. And maybe the person tells you that, okay, going to church, like, has an issue with going to church. Like, yes, I do my devotion at home. And you know that, okay, first to start with, there's an error somewhere. And, but the person sounds, like, comfortable, like, very comfortable. And I don't know, what do you do in that kind of The person thing? doesn't want to go to church. The person is not comfortable going to church. But the person believes that he or she is a Christian. Yes, very confidently. Yeah, so that one, too they need his discipleship. The person needs to know why he or she needs to be in the garden of saints. Right? Because there are certain things that you will never have if you do not get it in church. You can never get those alone. 
but starting from where you said yeah born in a christian home maybe you won't have pastors as parents it doesn't guarantee salvation at any point so the person is still if the person has not made the decision to come to christ by his himself or herself the person is not saved right even if the person is doing devotion the person is not saved so that's so you need to find out um, have you given your life to christ and be like, eh, she be, i'm already born again so, eh, have you given your life to christ so you will need to find that out if the person has come to faith in christ by his or her decision then you now need to help the person to see the light but if the person has not then the person has not all right so uh, let's do the online questions okay um the first question is with respect to good works in the work of faith does god count on it for your spiritual growth is it ultimately important to go to put some things in place yeah so if you have for instance prayer is a good work fasting is a good work reading your bible engaging scripture listening to messages um, evangelizing fellowshipping with believers those are good works and they are ultimately important for your spiritual growth so it's possible that you'll be a child of god but you're a baby and you are not grown because there are no good works so it's important to you to ensure that you bring good works to the table and it's also important to god that you bring good works to the table because let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father which is in heaven if your good works are not obvious to men there is a glory that god will not get right let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father they are seeing your good works they are glorifying your father so if good works are on the table then glory will come to god if good works are not on the table glory will be denied from god so good works are important for you and they are important for God. I want to think that I've answered that question. The next question is, what is the place of his sovereign will in interference with my good works? If what God will do, God will do. What then is the place of my good works? I think, I think the premise is wrong. God will not do what God will do. So the, the person is asking this question with a mindset that God will do what God will do. So what's the place of my good works? I'm saying that that premise is not correct. God wants to do something. If you don't come and join him to do it, he may not do it. Right? So there are many things that are the will of God but happen because the people who are meant to come into partnership with God have not come into partnership with God. They refused to join God to do it. So the problem with that question is the assumption. God will do what God will do. No. There is a way that God works. Right? And the way that God works on earth a lot of times is in partnership with people. Right? So if God wants to do something, a lot of times God will get somebody to pray about it. Then God will get someone to partner with him to ensure that that thing comes to pass. It's not because God cannot do it without the people. It's because God has decided not to. Right? So the place of your good works is actually necessary to ensure the thing that God wants to do to be done. And because what God will do, God will do is not correct. I think that that helps to clarify that question. Okay, third question. Please, what can I do when I constantly keep thinking that if I handle a verse, I will do better than others? Oh, yeah, yeah. You need to repent. Yeah, you need to repent. There is, like I said, that, that temptation is very rare, especially when you start studying scripture and it starts opening to you. Then maybe you now see that in church, you now hear your pastor preaching, and you're now like, what is this? Like, what? Right? And it looks like you have deeper insight than your pastor. Every Sunday you come to church, your pastor is just preaching things, and you're just wondering. It's not like he's preaching wrong things, so, but it's not deep like your own. You need to repent. You need to repent. Number one. 
Number two, you need to realize that the only reason why you have that kind of insight was because it was given to you. You see, so this, these are the kinds of, you, you are seeing application. The only reason why you know the Bible like that is because it was given to you. That's why you cannot be abusing someone that doesn't know the Bible like that. Because the difference between you and him is God. It's not you. It's not because you studied. Some of those people read the Bible more than you do. Some of them study. You will be shocked the amount of commentaries and textbooks that they are pouring into. And when they come out and they preach, you'll be like, this is what you were doing for seven hours. Meanwhile, if you had just one Bible for 30 minutes on that verse, you will come out with a lot than the person came out with. The difference between you and the person is that it was given to you. Jesus said to his disciples, it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. To them, it is not given. You are not the reason why you know a lot of Bible. God is the reason. And the same God that gave to you can take from you. Eh? The same God that gave to you can give to the other person. That's, so, number one, you need to repent. Number two, you need to realize that the only reason why you know this much is because it is grace, right? It's very easy to slip into a mode where we are not understanding of the shortcomings of people because of what we have received by grace. It's very easy. You can become very condemnatory because there are certain things that have been given to you and then when someone else falls short of that, you you look at the person and like, what's wrong with you? Meanwhile, the only reason why you are here was because it was given to you by grace. You get the point. So you, you need to realize that. The third thing that I also do, which I've said to people, and this is not something that is original to me. This is something that my father and the Lord taught us. That if you are in a meeting and somebody is teaching the Bible, and the person is not teaching error. You can learn from it. Whatever the person is teaching, as long as it's not error, you can learn from it. And you will need to humble yourself to learn from that thing. Even if the, the person is just teaching, we are loved of God. God loves us. Are you a child of... That's all the person is teaching. If you are there, no matter what the person is teaching, as long as that thing is not error, you can learn it. Right? You can learn it. Especially because if maybe you are in a member of the assembly, you are a member of the assembly, or or maybe the person organized the meeting and you attended, as much as the person is teaching, there is something else that is at work. And the other thing that is at work is authority. That's the other thing that is at work. This person has authority not because of the depth of what he's saying, but because of what Jesus has put upon him. And because you are submissive or you are submissive, yes, submitted, submitted. Because you are submitted to the authority of Christ, it's going to be in your best interest to listen to what the person who has authority is saying and learn it. That thing that is telling you that your pastor is not deep is the devil. Is the voice of Satan. You know, do you know I've even heard of people, they will go to church, then they have airports and they are listening to another preacher. Yes. So they are in church like, like this now. But me, I'm not deep. So, But they have one man that knows the seven galaxies in the underworld. So they will now put airports. Because this Bible study we are doing now, not really. This man, he knows the pathways in Zion. <laughs> <laughs> You, you know those things that people used to say? Those kind of things that when somebody say, say, Sha! There's nothing inside. That man, so somebody is listening with airports, but he's in church. Is a flagrant disuse, abuse, disrespect to the authority of Christ. If you don't want to be a member of the church, leave. Just go. Don't come and be saying the man is not deep. Go and find your depth. Go, that deep one that you're looking for, go and find the person. And it's even possible, it's possible that you have outgrown the man. Go. Yeah? 
let's assume that that's the case just go you need to bring a lot of humility to the table a lot of humility to the table but the primary way that it registers in your heart that humility is your understanding that this thing that i have they gave me i didn't work for it they gave me so if they have not given that man i'm going to understand that they have not given him do you get the point you cannot be proud with a gift that was given i mean in nigeria you can you can somebody that's your iphone then you say do you know who i am you it's not you that bought it is they dash you but logically it doesn't follow you cannot be proud because of something that was a gift so a lady is fine and she's proud why are you proud because you are fine did you create yourself do you get the point why are you what's making you proud about your beauty even you you just realized the same way other people are realizing that you are fine that's how you realized too so why are you proud what what exactly is the point but you see we don't think about these things deep enough right but the primary thing that will keep you is to realize that it is a gift the one you have was given huh therefore if the person doesn't have it it cannot be the fault of the person because it is a gift it is given this is different from if the person is teaching error i'm saying this person is not teaching error but it's just that you now because now you know how to explore the bible now you can see that this thing that he's saying it did not relate with do you get my point you are going to have to learn because whatever the person is teaching as long as the person is not teaching error you can learn from it right and you have to be gracious even when the person is teaching error There's a difference between a false teacher and a teacher that is teaching a false doctrine. There's a difference. If somebody is a minister of God, sometimes he will make mistakes and teach wrong things. Right? Hello? You need to be gracious enough to know that even you, if you teach, you will make a mistake one day. Even you, you will make a mistake. So, you need to ensure that, because the point is, you are not holding yourself accountable to the standard that you are imposing on the person that you are listening to, because you are sitting and the person is talking. If the tables were turned, you won't hold yourself to that standard. When we say, this thing that you said is wrong, you say, can somebody make mistake? But if someone said it, you say, do you get the point? So, you need to these heart issues, they are issues that you will need to resolve. And they are issues that you will need to keep checking. So that you do not get to the point where you cannot be blessed by anybody. I told someone that I know, I was telling him that the way you, you are going, you are becoming increasingly critical. Huh? This person, he's not my friend, but I know him. He is increasingly, he, his default position is to criticize. Huh? he criticizes everybody criticizes he has even criticized my father in the lord on there was a snippet that we put then he just came and attacked I, I say bros because you will not be able to learn from anybody meanwhile you have entered one chance once you have entered that place you have entered one chance already it doesn't mean that we cannot point out error it doesn't mean that if something is wrong, we cannot see that it's wrong. Of course, you can see that it's wrong. But you're going to need to be gracious. You're going to need to be gracious. There are a lot of times... You see, that's part of the reasons why you publicly not hear me attack a man of God. I'm not talking of Inda Boski, Man of God. <laughs> a man of God. You publicly not hear me attack a man of God. I may, in private, attack the doctrine. But you see, before I attack the doctrine... I have I've listened to hours of that teaching. Before I come and say this thing that this guy is saying now is is it's not because I just heard a snippet 20 seconds. I say hey, it's because we know we know. You know Starboy, we have listened to Starboy a lot. Do you get the point? You are going to have to be gracious. If not, you are going to get to the place where it will be hard 
to learn from anybody and this is a heart issue you are going to need to deal with it how will you deal with it go and meet god and beg god huh to help you and god will help you if you apply the other principles that i said all right is there another all right the next question please concerning the issues of the tribulation after the first flights can more lights be true no <laughs> More light cannot be true. <laughs> it was an example. And if you if if it's worrying you, forget I said it. It was just an example. Forget I made that comment. It is my opinion that after the rapture, Jesus will come. That's my opinion. So I don't agree to the opinion that after the rapture, then tribulation will now then Jesus will now come back. That's, that's, that's not the opinion I hold to. The opinion I hold to is that after the rapture, Jesus will come. The rapture is the end of the world. So my opinion is Christians will be around for the tribulation. I, I, I know that there, there is a view that says that we'll go, the rapture will happen, then the tribulation will happen. My own view is that during the tribulation, we dig ground or on ground fully during the tribulation then the rapture will happen then the world will end now that's the only light i have and I, I don't know if <laughs> if it is thrown <laughs> but that's the only light i have on that issue is there another question okay with regards to repentance to dead works yeah. dead works was defined as the things done to merit god's grace so yeah. in light of this how can i ensure that i continue to do the things that are needful and also ensure that my heart continues to sustain the posture that the release of grace came from God and not necessarily from the things I do. I'm asking this question because I think there are two extremes here. One, that God has done it all and I don't need to do anything. Two, that I need to pay the price for everything in order to merit the things that God gives. That's exactly why I started out by talking about good works. Good works are the things that necessarily follow salvation. So the things that you need to be doing are good works. Right? So if someone tells you, sleep, Jesus has paid the price. If you sleep, <laughs> hmm, the enemy will misbehave on your destiny. But it's not because you are awake that the enemy is not misbehaving on your destiny. It's actually because of what Jesus did. Huh? It's actually because of what Jesus did that we are protected, we are insulated from the hordes of darkness. But if you just sleep, you say, I'm not doing anything, I will not, I will just rest. That's not rest. Huh? That one is laziness. So that's why I started with good works, to say that there are works that believers need to do. You will need to do something. But that thing you will need to do is not to deserve. Do you, do you get the point? It's not to deserve it. It's not to earn it. It's not to merit it. It is because I have been saved that there are certain things that I will now need to do. I will pray because Jesus has defeated darkness. I will not pray. I'm not fighting with any demon because we are not sure what has happened. The demon has already lost. Right? When I do spiritual warfare, it is to enforce what Jesus has done. It is to say that there is something that Jesus has done and this demon is trespassing. Therefore, I will labor in prayer and fasting and the word to ensure that he gets off my space. If I say, Jesus has already won, therefore this demon cannot come near me, so I will sleep throughout. The demon will beat you up. You see, we wrestle not against flesh. Your own will not be wrestling, it will be beating. They will be beating you. However, when you are now wrestling against the forces of darkness, it's not because they have won. We don't know who we win. Let's fight and see who we win. No, that's not the point. The point is they have already lost. So I want to enforce my victory. I want to enforce my victory. Therefore, as a believer, you need to know that there are certain things that you need to bring to the table. Those things will not buy grace from God, but they will show God that you are serious. 
because he will not cast his spells before swine. So part, so part of the reasons why some people don't have encounters with God is because they cannot steward the encounter. God knows that if I give you an encounter, there is something that you need to do to steward it to ensure that it becomes maximized. But you have not been able to bring that into the table. Therefore, there will be no encounter delivered to you. It's not because if you do that thing, that's what will make God bring the encounter. No. God had always wanted to bring it. However, you will need to bring something to the table to show God that he's not wasting his time when he does business with you. What I'm talking of is earning. Earning. I'm not saying you should not do works. I'm saying your works cannot earn. That's why I spent a lot of time on good works. Because there are good works that you have to do as a believer. There are things... As believers, we have works. They are just not done to earn. They are done because he has given. We work out because he is working in. We are not working for. We are working out. It's because God has done that we can do. If God has done and you say you will not do, Satan will win. If you do and God has not done, Satan will win. So, you have to do because God has done. I hope this helps that person. I hope so. We're good? That Okay, one more. All right. My good afternoon, sir. Thank you so much. My question, how do I deal with the need to share the things that God shares to me? God shares with me. I don't know if it's simply from a need to teach or from simply being too quick to speak. Um, I have a very long answer to that question but for this person, because you are asking the question, stop sharing yeah, stop sharing if you are not sure why you are sharing, stop sharing when I was in NYSC I used to go to NCCF and I was not an executive in the fellowship so hi. so we will go for Bible study then the Bible study teacher will be teaching this person will be yearning dust. Huh? Then, because I used to run my own meetings, my friends will know, then they will now throw the floor open, see who has any contribution. My friends will know that I can actually teach this thing correctly. They will now say I should talk, I will not say one word. I never said a word until the day God told me to speak. They will say, if, if you know the right thing, why are you not teaching it? There are many people here that will be misled. I will not speak simply because I know. I was quiet for a number of months. I did not say anything until the day that God said, this one, this one, talk about it. After I talked that day, the next meeting, they invited me to preach. When I now came to preach, after that message, they did not invite me again. <laughs> that was the first and the last. They didn't invite me again. But the point is, if you have a lot of things in your heart to share and you just feel like sharing, if you are not sure of the motive, keep quiet first. You need to become a custodian of secrets. Huh? You need to. You see, sometimes I can read one verse and there are things that I've seen in the verse, but I can't just say it because I know it. wait just keep keep keeping the secrets keep them keep them let them brew in your heart you, you do not know that spiritual things especially with teaching they take time to ferment there is a reason why somebody can preach and when he preaches the hearts of people will be set on fire and somebody else will come and preach the same thing and everybody will clap for him and he'll go to his seat part of the reasons sometimes is because the first person that thing has cooked inside his heart, eh? it has fermented. Now, that thing can intoxicate. So, the person is preaching, then people are praying. People are praying. It's not that he studied yesterday to come and impress. No, there is something, that thing has probably been learned for the past four years. It has been in the heart. If you are not sure that God wants you to talk, keep it. That's a general rule. Right? If you are not sure. If Hello? It's a general rule. If you are not sure that God wants you to talk, keep quiet. 
if you are still saying should i share is this my motive is this god is this me do i want to be seen yeah, keep quiet that that will help you at least until god ensures that that thing is clarified don't share rema because you have rema don't teach because you know teach because you are sent Hmm? You, you think I don't have deep I have deep things so, oh I have deep from weird passages of the Old Testament <laughs> weird I mean weird passages the kind of thing that you have never seen before when I now open it I now show you say Jesus that's not the goal there are things that I have studied huh? they are in my journal they will not come out of my mouth do you, this thing that i say i will teach now this in christ thing that i want to teach i finished that study in 2016 like to a satisfactory level i'm satisfied that i've exhausted most i don't want to say all so i do not be as if i'm proud but i've i've exhausted most of the biblical data concerning that 2016 to teach that thing i had to go and look for my journal of i had to go and excavate it huh because i thought what i thought was i will refresh my memory so i'll do the study again i saw that no it was something i saw that time that again i had to go and look for that journal think about it there is something that has been in your spirit for six years it has been in your journal it has been in your spirit for six years the only reason i'm teaching it is because god came and said it is time to teach this thing Meanwhile, somebody will just see something in devotion. Next thing is Facebook. <laughs> jup, 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 jup. Boom. That's part of the reasons why your words don't have punch. It's because you talk too much. There's you're always teaching something. You always calm down. Don't teach because you know. Huh? Teach because there's a need. Jesus said, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Therefore, I will not teach you. What I will do is I will send the spirit of truth to enable you to bear them. Then he will guide you into all truth. That's what Jesus did. That's the kind of teacher to be. Jesus was the kind of teacher that will not teach things because he knows them. He will teach it because that's what the people need. Are you following? Do you know there are some times that I travel and when I go somewhere to preach, what God is impressing in my spirit is something I've taught a while ago. Sometimes I even I actually used to feel like what if somebody here has heard that message? The person would think that this is the only message that I have. But I will teach it because that's what the people God said that's what they need. Your your goal is not to show people that you have new stuff. Do you get it? I can use the same scripture, the same teaching, I will teach it in 14 churches. Because that's what Meanwhile, when I teach it, they will upload it to Telegram. You download it. Tomorrow is the same message. You will teach it like that. Because that's what the people need. So if you are not sure that it's God that is leading you to teach, close your mouth. That's all, yeah? Uh-uh. So that's the last online. This one. Uh, I'm saying this. No, this one now is the last one. After this one, <laughs> we need to take a break. On the aspects of having fellowship with God, why is it that many people get worried on the long run? And what is the possible solution? I may not know why many people get worried. I mean, I may not know all of the reasons. But part of the solutions is to have a company. Ensure that you're not doing God alone. Try to ensure that there's a company of people. Have a church, have a small group, have a prayer partner. Have someone that you share the Bible together with. If you have those kinds of structures, two, three of you where you just come to just edify yourself. The Bible says that if one falls, the other will help him up. Right? Uh -huh. Two is better than one because they have much profit for their labor. If one falls, the other person will help him up. So part of the ways to ensure that you don't get weary is to have a company. And I think that that's part of the only... That's like the only thing I'm permitted to say today because I... I sense why the person is asking. So, have a company, find a group of people, two people, three people, there may be people in your church, in the fellowship that you attend and all of that. Have people that you do Jesus with. Don't do Jesus alone. We were not created to exist alone. 
All right, next. Can God use a Christian brother immediately who was rising and falling and he resolved in his mind not to go back into sin again in his life after many years of rising and falling? Yes. When God forgives, God forgives. So if the person has come to God and said, Lord, I'm sorry, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. You come to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry. God can use you the next instant. Look at Samson. Right? So God does not say, okay, I've, I've forgiven you, but you will need to prove to me that for the next nine months now, you know, that's not how God is. Right? So the moment God purifies, God can empower. And when God empowers, then God can use. That's it, yeah? That's it. All right. So there was one question here, and then we'll take the break. Praise the Lord. Um, my question is, is just, I need help yeah. from what I'm understanding from the team. Um, from the way I'm understanding the teaching, yeah. the difference between good works and dead works is motive. Motive, yeah. The standpoint, where yeah. you're standing, your heart posture. Yeah. Because from the way I'm understanding it, Two people can do the same spiritual activity yeah. and one will be tagged good works yeah. and other dead works. Yes. Um, that's okay. Yeah. That's just it. Right. Yeah. That's the correct understanding. All right. So we'll take a break. Um and then we'll come back at two fifteen. So we take a 40 minute break. Yeah, that's 40 minutes. So we'll take a 40 minute break. We'll come back at 2.15 and we will continue. So if you are following us online, we'll be back, we'll be back by 2.15. Yeah, so we'll take a 40 minute break and then by 2.15 we gather again to continue our discussion. God bless you. <laughs> 